Well, let me say good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Gary, for those uh, words. And it's exciting to always be here at the Affirming of the Faith. Uh, it's just like a homecoming. This is a taste of what heaven is going to be like one day. And as I think specifically about this class, it makes me feel good. And it's quite exhilarating uh, to my family to see folks from Hinton and to see folks from Stillwater from Hutchinson and Wayne, and I go all the way back to Jefferson City. So, and, uh, so it, it's really, really good to be with you. I hope you have your Bibles. We're going to be in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Do you recognize that man behind me on the big screen? His name is Larry Walters. Now, I kind of, Avon Malone used to say I was born in 1900, none of your business. Back in 1982, 1983, I would have just been a pretty young kid at that point. But Larry Walters had a dream to always fly. But because of some medical disabilities, he couldn't. So he decided that he was going to fly, so he bought 42 weather balloons. He purchased many tanks of helium. He tied them to a lawn chair and he tethered them to a Jeep. Now, something you don't see in that photograph is he also had a BB gun because he knew that he'd have to shoot each of those balloons to get him back down on the ground safely. Now, this was Larry's intention that he was going to go up about 100 feet in the air and that he was going to get to see his entire neighborhood. Well, a friend had a different story. He untethered him from his Jeep. And I'm not exaggerating this morning at all. He went up 16,000 feet. Now, we have a retired airport director at Stillwater, and he would tell you what I'm getting ready to tell you. Planes saw Larry Walters. A pilot from Continental said, you are not going to believe what we just saw. <laughs> they had to divert plane traffic because of what took place. Well, Larry began to shoot those balloons down in that Los Angeles sky. He landed 30 miles away in Long Beach, California. And he was welcomed back by the authorities that you spoke about last night, Keith, but in a different way. And before they arrested him, all of the media outlets were there and they said, why did you do it? And he had one answer, and I want you to see this. You just can't sit there. Let me tell you what, that is a call for the church. That's a call for you. That is a call for me. And that's what this weekend is all about. This weekend is all about go, tell, show, make relationships. So I want you to look at this very familiar text, Acts chapter 8. Luke is the, uh, the author. And he says here, beginning in verse 26, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out on his way and he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And he was on his way home sitting on his chari in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and to sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before she the shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. 
Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? Verse 34. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And if you like to underline in your Bibles, let me tell you what, you ought to underline verse 35. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot, and then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. You know, there's a lot of things that could be said about this passage. But I've narrowed it down to several points, and then we've got some applications. And I learned that in Stillwater. The most important part is what can this do for you and for me? I want you to think about the first phrase, the soul winner. You know, when you think about Philip, you're, he's going to be referenced as one of the chosen seven in Acts chapter 6. He's going to be referred to as Philip the Evangelist in Acts chapter 21 in verse 8. But I want you to see the geography here. Here we've got, and, and I'm telling all of you this morning something that you already know. Whenever we talk about Jesus and we talk about the church, we talk about the disciples... We're always talking about Galilee in the north, you've got Judea in the south, and you've got Samaria. Now, when you think about geography, and then I want you to see this map here. Here we've got again Samaria, here we've got Jerusalem, here we've got Gaza. If you go back to Acts chapter 8, and I want you to see this, in verse 4, Acts 8 and verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Verse 5, Philip went to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. We're going to come back to that in just a moment, but we've got Philip working in Samaria. And now you've got an angel of the Lord and you've got the Spirit of God that tells them they want him to be involved in a new work. And there's something very important that I want to mention more than once. There were many men and women that were baptized at the preaching of Christ in Samaria from Philip. But God had a different plan. He wanted him to leave a place where many souls were being brought to him and to go talk to someone else. And you know, it's pretty amazing when you think about geography. This, I mean, this just, in my mind, this didn't make a lot of sense. You've got him doing a great work here with a lot of people. And now you want Philip to move from Samaria down to Jerusalem. And now you're to take the south road that leads to Gaza. Now, I'm not telling you something you don't already know. The Gaza Strip is going to be right in here. Gaza, one of the ancient, ancient Philistine cities. So here we've got the angel of God telling him, I want you to move from this work here. I want you to come down to Jerusalem. And I want you to go down this deserted road to Gaza. During the summertime in Hinton, we had major road construction on I-40. And we had a summer series like many of your churches do. And I had to tell the preachers to use 66, Route 66, get your kicks out of Route 66, okay, Get, go to El Reno and then take 66 to come in Hinton. Don't come down I-40. The traffic is not good. Well, let me tell you what. Everyone was happy with that except for my father-in-law. Because the city or the county, they ended up laying a lot of rocks on the side of 66 to help with the trucks. Well, my, my, the trucks ended up picking up a lot of those stones. And my father-in-law got a chip windshield, okay? So he would say, don't go on 66, just go down I-40 and just, you know, take all the time you want. When we talk about Philip, I bring that up. I want you to take that deserted road, that desert road that goes to Gaza. It doesn't appear to me, he tells Philip, 
who or how many people he's going to have an opportunity to talk to. But that's coming. And then you've got the Spirit that tells him that he needs to run up to that chariot. And that chariot had more than one person, but the person we talk about and person this lesson today is about that Ethiopian eunuch. But let me tell you something else. It, number one, it didn't make a lot of sense for him to leave a big group to go and follow what God wanted him to do, but he decided he would do it. And I want you to look at this uh, second phrase. So we move from the soul winner to the seeker. Now, if you look at your text again, you can see that he's an Ethiopian eunuch. And I want you to, uh, to see another map. Here we've, got, uh, Ethi- here we've got Ethiopia, and here we would have Israel, or we would have Gaza. Do you know that's over a thousand miles? A thousand miles. Let me show you another better map. When we think about Africa in particular, we've got two young ladies here today from Ghana and... and uh, And Nigeria, that's exactly right. We've got Ghana, where is, there's Ghana, and there's Nigeria. When we were working in Stillwater, let me tell you one of the greatest things about the Stillwater work. The world has come to Oklahoma State. I I mean, there's no exaggeration on that. The opportunities to tell people about Jesus are endless. But we're going to come back to this at the end. You don't have to live in Stillwater to teach and to live Jesus Christ. That's what this weekend is all about. It can happen in any size community that we're living in. But let me tell you what, Africa means a lot to Carl and I because some of our best friends are from Nigeria and from Ghana. And uh, Keith, you took off a shirt last night. I didn't want to be so bold. So I brought my show and tell. Now, I'm glad I lost a little weight because uh, they make these a little bit, uh, uh, not big, a little bit on the small side, okay? They made, uh, Carla and I, these beautiful shirts. They made her a beautiful dress. These came from Ghana. They mean a lot. We support, when I was in Hutchinson, Kansas, we supported Roger Dixon. They've been supporting him for 40 years there in South Africa. The Hidden Congregation has been supporting a man since we were there the first time in Kenya. We've had young men and young women in our home in Stillwater from Ethiopia. This man had traveled a thousand miles to worship. I think there's something else that we need to be sure to to say about this man. And you see that he was the Secretary of the Treasury. The Secretary of the Treasury. I don't know if, uh, Jedediah, would you ever feel comfortable coming up here in the front and just reading one, a couple of words off this, this dollar bill? Can you read to everyone what that says there? Can you make out that print? 70 Mygum. Secretary. So small. Yeah. Secretary of the Treasury. Can, and you probably can barely make out that guy's name, Stephen Manchin. Let's give Jedediah a great big hand. Take that with you. Now, and see, I'm a cheapskate. I didn't give you the five or the ten. I don't want you to pull out your money. Somebody will think this preacher is trying to get a contribution today. But I want you after class to look, and on every one of your bills, whether it's a ten or a five and a one, there's going to be a secretary of treasury. And there's going to be a different person's name depending on the year. This Ethiopian was a very significant individual. Now, the other thing I want to be sure to point out that he was a eunuch. In layman's terms, he could not father children. I want you to put in your notes Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 1. That eunuch, the closest that he could get to worship God in Jerusalem was the court of the Gentiles. That's the closest he could get. There was signage that no Gentiles could go past a certain point. 
I can remember something like that when we were up in Hutch years ago about a sign telling folks not to go into another part of the building. Let me tell you what, that sign came down. We've got a denominational building right now in Hinton. On the back side of their building, it says no trespassing. Probably not the best sign to have up Monday through Saturday and Sunday. Think about this. This man traveled a thousand miles and the closest he could get to worship God was the court of the Gentiles. You think about last night if you were here or this morning if you heard Tim. Can you imagine there, some of us have traveled at least 50 miles from Stillwater and Hinton. Some of you have traveled from Branson. We got Tennessee, maybe it was Mississippi, wherever the states or wherever you're from. Can you imagine coming to affirming of the faith and having to park yourself in the foyer and not being allowed into the auditorium. You know what we'd say about you? You are dedicated. You're pretty dedicated that you would drive 50 miles, 100 miles, and you can't even get into the auditorium. Do you know what that tells me about that Ethiopian eunuch? He was dedicated. He was sincere. And he was religious I don't want to take the time now, but uh, when I was taking Greek at uh, Oklahoma Christian, I had that with Lauren Giger. And let me tell you what, Greek was tough, okay? Greek was tough. Didn't get an A in that, that course. When we were there at Oklahoma Christian and he was teaching Greek, he said, guys, there's a great possibility if this Ethiopian eunuch was reading out of Isaiah chapter 53, he had the scroll. He had a part of the scroll, and he probably had Isaiah chapter 56. You go back this afternoon and read Isaiah chapter 56, and there's a promise for the eunuchs. There is a promise for those that could not father children. Do you know what that promise was? Salvation. Let me tell you what, that's something that'll preach. You know, as you think about the soul winner, as you think about this seeker, I am reminded that as he is told to run up to this chariot, this has not been heard. This is not a fast chariot. This is something that would move more like a cart about 15 to 18 miles a day. There was at least one more person in that cart because in verse 38, he gave the orders for it to stop. So we're talking about something that was larger. And I want you to see, and you see it on the, the, the PowerPoint uh, this morning, that he runs up alongside this Ethiopian eunuch and he asked him the question, do you understand what you are reading? Let me tell you what, we need to start asking more questions. Jesus Christ did a lot of his ministry by asking questions. The Hinton folks have heard me say, and the Stillwater folks have heard me say, I've got a book, and it's, it's entitled, It Doesn't Hurt to Ask. I told the folks in Stillwater and in Hinton, unfortunately, I haven't finished the book, but you know what the premise of the entire book is? You need to be asking more questions. And this fella talks a lot about Jesus and his ministry. That's exactly how Philip begins this discussion. Do you understand what you're reading? And the obvious answer was, well, no. And that man was reading from Isaiah chapter 53. And you know, as you think about him reading from Isaiah chapter 53, he's reading about Jesus. And the man asked the question in verse 34, Tell me, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? You know, sometimes I think as a preacher, I particularly need to hear this. Let people ask questions and don't be working on your reply. Be listening. Sometimes that's one of the hardest things for me to do is to listen. Now he reads this beautiful passage. He's got a second question. And he wants to know who it's about. And according to verse 35, 
He begins with Isaiah chapter 53 and he tells him about Jesus Christ. Amen. Man, I wish I could have heard that sermon, don't you? I mean, what a sermon. This class is not about Cornelius, but Cornelius is just like this eunuch in Acts chapter 10. He wanted Peter to know we're here to hear what the Lord wants us to do. And that's the kind of heart that this Ethiopian eunuch has. And that's exactly why Philip tells him the good news about Jesus. I want you to see something that in Acts chapter 8, when you've got Philip preaching Christ, that, that's how it's defined. Then you've got Philip preaching in verse 11, the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Christ. And it says they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. Let me tell you something you already know. When you talk and preach about Jesus, it's only natural you're going to talk about baptism. It's just natural. And the conclusion, the conclusion with this model message and the question on who Jesus is, is about how we get into him. And when the question is asked, that next question, lots of questions in this text, why shouldn't I be baptized? You see on the PowerPoint, he had to have talked about baptism when he's talking about Jesus because that's the question he asks. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders for that chariot to stop. And Philip and that Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. You know, this man didn't know a lot of theology. But he knew from this one sermon that baptism would put him into Jesus Christ. You know these passages. Mark chapter 16, whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Galatians chapter 3, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. Let me ask you a question, especially since I've talked about questions. Have we complicated the plan of salvation have we complicated what we really need to be telling? You know, when we were in Hinton 20 years ago, sitting around a, a meal table because we developed some relationships with two families in the community, and that individual had questions about music in the church. He had questions about eldership. He had questions about marriage and divorce. He had questions about miracles. You know what I chose to do? I chose to do what I learned in searching for truth. I said, you know, those are great questions. Those are questions we want to look at. But there's something else that we need to talk about first. Have we complicated things? You know, in John 16 and verse 12, Jesus says, I have many more things to say, but more than what you can bear. Jesus knew without a doubt at that point in time, at that space in their life, they didn't need to hear those answers immediately. Why do we feel compelled to always give out all of those other answers. Let me tell you what Kelly told me. They were baptized a short time later, and then we got to those other truths. But he said this, if you would have answered my questions that night, I would never have become a Christian because I wasn't in the space in time that I could have accepted those answers. Why? Because we were building a relationship every time we were with one another. He was seeing and acknowledging the significance and the importance of Scripture. You know, as you think about the end of that story, I'm not telling you something you don't already know, that that word baptism is baptizo. That word means, bap that means, that means immersion. 
Every time you see that. He immersed that Ethiopian eunuch when they went down into that water. They came up out of that water and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. We certainly could ask some questions about ourselves. Was I old enough to make a personal commitment when I was baptized? Did I understand what I was doing? Was I immersed? But, but that's not what this weekend is about. Let me give you some applications because these are important. This is the first. You matter to God. If you're struggling with who Jesus is, you matter. If you're a parent or a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle might be aunt in whatever part of the country you come from instead of aunt. You matter to God. If you're struggling with sexual immorality, if you're struggling with pornography, you matter to God. Let's make it a little bit bigger. If you're married, your spouse matters to God. Your children, your grandchildren, no matter if they're young or preteen or college age or youth group, they matter to God. For those of us that are not retired and we go to work on Monday, for those of you that are retired, the people you surround yourself with, they matter to God. You know, there's something I really appreciate about the Hinton Church. And it could be said of any of the congregations here. We could say the same thing about Stillwater or any of the other places we've been. In Hinton, we've been supporting the Tipton home for as long as I can remember. So this is looking back 25 to 30 years, and it still goes back further. Do you know why the church in Hinton supports an orphanage for kids? Because those kids matter to God. You know why our ladies bought Christmas gifts for 15 girls there at the Tipton home? Because those girls matter to God. When you think about the Westview Boys Home, we've been supporting it for just as long, just as you're doing. In whatever capacity and whichever home, why do we support them monthly? I think we give them $350 a month. That's a car payment. And unfortunately, that's a cheap car payment. But they get that every month for the last 30 years at least. Why? Because we believe that those boys mean everything to God. Let me tell you something about Stillwater. We said it earlier. We've, we've, got, we've got folks working on their PhD from Africa. Do you know why we have a... Bible chair, do you know why we have a university center? That, that's what we call it. University Center in Stillwater. Because we believe people working on their PhDs and we believe people working on their master's degrees and their bachelor's degrees, we believe they matter to God. And you can even be in a small community in a much smaller congregation like Hinton or maybe other congregations in this room and you know what? We support the Bulldogs for Christ. Oh, my word, who would be a Bulldog? I'm talking about Swazoo there in Weatherford. Why do we send them $350 a month? Because we believe that they matter to God. Do you know it was just uh, in the last couple of months, I was able, with some of our other members, we prepared everything for a meal. Every Tuesday, they, they feed and they invite students from the whole campus to come. They had 150 students show up for that. Amen? Amen. Do you know probably only 100 out of that 150, there were just 40 that belonged to the Bible chair or the university center? Let me tell you what, those are pretty good statistics. Amen? This is what this weekend is all about. Sent, go, tell, show, make relationships. You matter to God. 
I think there's a second application, and it's this fact. Don't make negative assumptions about other people. Tim just said that. And it can happen to any one of us in this room. I thought about Luke chapter 7 this past week. You remember that Pharisee thought to himself, he didn't say it out loud, he thought to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know. He would know who was washing his feet. That's a pretty sad, sad commentary on that Pharisee. I think about Luke chapter 15, and I just thought about this a couple of weeks ago. There in verse 1 and 2, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they disliked it because Jesus was not only eating with the tax collectors and sinners, but what other word? He was welcoming them. And then he tells those three parables you know well. Parable of the lost sheep, parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the two lost sons. Think about that. They didn't like it that Jesus was welcoming them. Let me tell you what. Can we do a better job of welcoming people from our community for them to see Jesus? Can we have a more welcoming spirit ourselves? You know, my grandpa... We've got someone here today that's uh, from Park Rapids, okay? My grandfather, I'm named after two grandpas. My grandpa was not a Christian. He was not converted until his 50s. There were people then that would say out loud, don't waste your time on Ray Newkirk. He'll never believe. He'll never come to Christ. Don't waste your time. You know what? I'm glad that God used different people to come into his life. And finally, there were questions that were asked that he couldn't answer. You know what? My grandpa became a Christian. And my grandpa converted my folks. I would not be a preacher if it hadn't been for other people that had this desire to share, tell, show, go, have a relationship, but most importantly, not making negative assumptions about other people. Let me give you a third application. Reach one. One. You know, Carla and I and our two kids have had an opportunity to work in large congregations, in middle-sized congregations, and smaller congregations. And do you know what I've discovered? about all three different sizes, it all comes down to one. Preachers, I hate to ruin your day, but at least in my preaching and teaching, most people are not saved behind the podium. It's one on one. That's how God leads. You know, we live in a culture where we've got more people today in 2024 they don't know that they're heading for a Christless eternity. When I was growing up in LaPorte, Indiana with my folks, we had a Kroger store. And my mom had three of us. I had a younger brother and a younger sister. We went into Kroger's. I don't know what caused things to get so frantic, but... Believe it or not, we left my younger brother at Kroger's and went home. <laughs> now, in 2024, you'd really be in trouble if you did that. I don't know why we didn't notice that, that he was missing. When my mother recognized we left Sean, let me tell you what, she exceeded all speed limits. <laughs> we, re- we got back to Kroger's. She was bawling. She thought she was a horrible mother. And there was my little brother with his feet propped up in the manager's office drinking a Dr. Pepper, starting a second candy bar. He was as happy as a lark. But when he saw my mom's tears, when he saw how emotionally distraught he was, do you know what happened? He broke down and began to cry. He didn't know that he was lost. 
until he was found. Here is the last application. You guys have done so good. Here's the last one. We're almost done. Let me tell you what. As churches and as individuals, we're going to have to think outside the box. Jeff Walling, years ago at the uh, Tulsa workshop, he said, we can't change the message, amen? amen? But we should be willing to change the methods. Not everything that has worked in the past is going to work in the present. Let me give you just a, a few ideas. And, and, and these are not catastrophic, out-of-this-world ideas, but these are things that we've used in various congregations and have just used it hint that are working. And any ideas that, that I share are things that we've not only used, but I'm constantly looking at the Christian Chronicle. I'm constantly asking other preachers and teachers, what are you guys doing? Because there's a lot of things that can be used in different congregations. They just need to be edited up or edited down. And yes, there are some things that won't work, but there are a lot of things that will work. Let me give you one example. When it comes to Vacation Bible School, we passed out leaflets all over town. And when we were in Stillwater, we, we did a radius around our building. Somebody says, well, that doesn't sound like that big of a deal. Well, let me tell you what. I have been at some places. They just use social media only. Social media is excellent. It works, and we've used it every place I'm at. But we still need to be going door to door. When it comes to Vacation Bible School or any kind of program that we're having in our churches, do you know what the most important words are? Follow up. Every one of the children that attended our vacation Bible school, we followed up with every one of them. And instead of just having the preacher and the elders do that, we asked the congregation, who will take two visits? We only want a porch visit. We don't want you to call. We just want it to be a porch visit. Will you take some cookies? Take some brownies? And we told the people through a letter, someone's going to be coming with a picture of your child. And we did that. And I wish you could see some of those notes. When you're planning a vacation Bible school on Wednesday night, we invited all the parents and the grandparents to come back to see their kids and their grandkids on video and on picture. Let me tell you what, that, that's a lot of work. Because I told the people taping, you be sure to get every last little child on that video. That's not easy. You just need a glimpse. Do you know that night... We had 80 guests come back. Do you know how many church members were there that night? About 40. We had more guests than we did members. Do you think that excited the church at Hinton? You think that excited those other churches where we've been at? And those churches that have been doing those things? We've got to be thinking outside the box. Every one of those children went into a, uh, a data box. In, in our data sheets. Every one of these kids that came to Vacation Bible School, they got a personal invitation in the mail to come back for our trunk or treat. Let me tell you something about our church, smaller church. We had 486 kids come to trunk or treat. That's a lot of kids. Do you know where a lot of those kids came from? Vacation Bible School. Follow-up is so important. We have changed up our Sunday nights. Some. If your Sunday nights are working, great. But if your eldership is, is into making some kinds of changes where we're not changing the message, but we want to change the methods, that too is great. We now have a, we have a first Sunday uh, where we've got life groups, and we've always got at least one life group that meets at the building. We've done that every place I've been at. That, that's important. And if we're not going to be at the building, we always have notes up on the glass doors telling folks, we didn't meet tonight, but we'd love for you to come back on next Wednesday or next Sunday. I don't want guests to come to a door and, and wonder, where are they? I want people to know. On the second Sunday night of the month, we have a regular Bible study, but we've moved everything out of the auditorium and up to the fellowship hall. When I was at Stillwater... I wanted to move everything out of that huge auditorium over to the fellowship hall when we're doing special things or doing teaching. It's hard when you're looking at the backside of somebody's head to have a great discussion. 
It's hard to hear people. We need to be looking at one another. We have a fourth Sunday for the a Sunday night for the Savior. We simply took a Monday night for the Master and moved it to once a month on Sundays. We took out the food part because we're already doing a lot of food parts. We have a couple people that are providing desserts. And then we set up about 10 or 11 tables and we've got cards already prepared. This last Sunday night, we had 24 cards for thinking of you, projects that we can do for people in the community or in the church, homebound members. We don't do all the birthdays and anniversaries. That's too many. But you know what? We know some people that need extra encouragement. But then let me tell you something else that goes right alongside of it. We spend, they were doing this in Stillwater through one member. Here we're doing it through the church. We do house to house. We don't do this once a month, but once a quarter. We spend almost $600. You can do the, the multiplication. Six times four, that's 24. Woo, I got that one, okay. $2,400 a year, and they get a colored copy of this into their home. And they will put your congregation's name and, and who the ministers are and your times of worship. But let me tell you what's invaluable about this. We pay an extra $5 a month and 50 cents an address for anyone that moves into our community or someone that has moved from one house to the next. Do you know once a month we make visits to everyone that shows up on that list? Let me tell you what, that's what being sent is all about. Touch points. Meeting people with brownies and, and cookies or whatever it is. And that flyer about the Church of Christ. When you move from one house to another, there's a lot of new things going on in your family's life. And if you're moving into town, it is great to know that there is a church that cares. Radio. In Hutchinson, in Stillwater, and in Hinton, we're doing radio. We've got a program every day for a minute to a minute and a half that has a listening area of 16,500 people. And on the intro and on the out, they talk about the Hinton Church of Christ. There's something great taking place there through God. And they meet at such and such a times, and we'd love for you to come back. Radio can be a great tool, and there's a lot of radio stations that want that. At the Trunk or Treats, I could tell you that we have had weddings... And we have had baptisms that were the result, believe it or not, of a trunk or treat. Somebody says, how? We've got to have entry points. We've got to be touching people. We've got to be thinking outside of the box to make contacts. And let's remember this as we bring this to an end. Sometimes you are going to reap what others have planted from years ago. And some of the seed that you're planting right now in 2024 in the Hinton Church, it's not going to always reap. We're not always going to have what we desire for Jesus that month or two months later or six months later. It might be years. And every one of us have stories that say that very same thing. Well, this is where we started 16,000 feet in the air. Why'd you do it, Larry? You just can't sit there. God bless you. Thank you for being here.